So this is, I don't even know what number this is, maybe our ninth or 10th AZ4H Ag at Home webinar series. And today we are talking about cavies. I am Dr. Betsy Green and myself and Ashley Wright have, um, were the creators of this way back in, gosh, November, I guess it was when we started the webinar series. And so Ashley Wright, who's an area livestock agent who works out of Cochise County, is our presenter for tonight. And then later on, we'll have Josh Moore, who many of you have seen on these before, and also Heather Wood, who's a Pima 4-H KV project volunteer. So Ashley, you, you wanna pop that next slide? Maybe? There we go. All right, so we have the same type of thing, webinar etiquette. We have all participants muted, no camera, since it's learning experience with limited time frame. You have, you guys all know the drill here, but if you're just chatting um, with panelists and or attendees, there's, if you get to the chat box and you see the all panelists or all panelists and attendees, if you want it to everybody to see it, then you put all panelists and attendees. If you have a question for the speaker or about the topic, that would go in the question and an answer box. If Ashley happened to ask you what color were all of your guinea pigs and put it in the chat box. So if you ask a question, just be patient and just ask it once because it may be addressed at the time by one of us, or it may also be um, addressed at the end of the presentation. Okay, we are recording. And of course the recording will be available later. And you guys have been to all the places where you can get to everything. And of course, if we have any kind of inappropriate or harassing behavior, or if somebody starts getting too far off topic or typing things that are not related to the topic tonight, then we'll have to get after you. And if it's harassment or whatever, you just, you'll be gone before you know it. But we don't want that. We don't think that will happen. So one more slide. And of course, earn and learn Ag at Home t-shirt that will be available if you've attended five or more of these live. And we have at least nine or 10 that have already earned them and several probably will earn tonight. But after the series, or even actually we're getting ready to order those pretty soon. So if you've earned one, you'll get a email from us and you don't have to worry, we will, <clears throat> we will actually, um, contact you. So uh, with that, I think we'll turn it over to Ashley Wright, and she will talk to us about cavies. Okay. It's all yours, except you're muted. There it goes. I don't know what I don't know what's going on with Zoom today, but it is misbehaving. Zoom was wow. misbehaving. So well, it's still misbehaving. It took me three times to unmute myself. So Okay, well, I am going to disappear while you talk to us about KVs 101. All right, I bet you guys didn't know I knew anything about KVs, huh? So when I was uh, young and in 4-H, I actually had KVs and rabbits both. Um, so I'm going to talk about KVs today. Really? We are going to go through some of the basics um, about KVs. Um, we're going to go through some different things here, but to start with, what is a KV? So a KV is really just another term for a domestic guinea pig. And you guys, I'm going to ask you guys, get your chat fingers ready, okay? So here we go. What other animal species is a KV or a guinea pig most closely related to? Do you think it's rats and mice? Do you think it's the capybara, which is this guy up here? also known as the largest rodent in the world. Is it a cat? This would be Tucker in a box. This is my, or, um, Bobo in a box. This is my cat Bobo. And, or is it the rabbit? What do you guys think? Pop that in the chat and tell me. I see 
twos, mm -hmm. twos. All right, you guys are smart, man. I could not fool you. If you said the capybara, you were correct. So cavies and capybaras are in the same family, but their next closest relative would actually be rats and mice. Um, so all of those fall under the order rodentia. So they're all rodents. Um, rabbits, however, are not rodents. They are a completely different order entirely. They're considered lagomorphs. So that was your, your lesson for the day um, about the what family and what relatives guinea pigs are related to. We're gonna have another one here, true or false. Some countries raise guinea pigs for food. What do you guys think? Is that true or is that false? True, yes, true, very good. That's true. There are several South American countries, Bolivia, Colombia, Ecuador, and per Peru in particular. That's all these guys over here in the Andes region. They raise guinea pigs like livestock. They use them for food. It's called koi, and it's considered a delicacy there. So just so you were wondering, they aren't pets everywhere, although we think they're cute and we treat them like pets here. So as we talk about cavies, there are 13 recognized breeds of cavies by the American Cavy Breeders Association or the American Rabbit Breeders Association. Uh, they kind of all fall under the same thing these days. Um, so the short haired breeds, there's Abyssinians, which are these guys here, they have these rosettes all over their body. They actually have to have a certain number of them in a specific pattern. Um, or they get docked points during show. These also come in a satin variety. And the satin varieties are really cool. The hair shaft on them has a translucent outer layer that makes them look super shiny. So most of these breeds, not all of them, but most of them also come in a satin variety. So we have the Abyssinian with his like eight rosettes. What's up, Betsy? Hey, I just have to let you know, I had one of those and his name Did was you? Thor. Thor, how adorable. What I had I had one of the long-haired Peruvians myself. Holy smokes. Yeah. So these are those Abyssinians. There's the Americans, which are sort of the traditional short-haired KB. They also come in a satin. We have the Teddies, which have this very short little plush coat. The Texels with their sort of long curly mop looking thing here. And then we have the white crested, which have this white rosette, and then they can come in a bunch of other colors here too. You can't hear me, Betsy. Can you guys hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Um, perhaps James needs to work on checking his computer volume or something. Okay, I just wanted to make sure it wasn't me. I saw the chat come up there. So those are those kind of shorter haired breeds. And there's also some long haired KV breeds. We have the Coronet with the rosette and the long hair. We have the Peruvian, and there you can see a picture of the Peruvian satin with the shiny hair. And the Silky um, right here as well. So these are all the breeds that are recognized in the United States. There are some other breeds of KV out there, um, but these are the ones that are primarily um, available here um, and that are typically seen at KV shows. So here's kind of what we're gonna talk about today. Uh, we're gonna to talk about what does a KV need to be healthy. We're gonna talk about some housing. We're gonna talk about water. We're gonna talk really a lot about KV nutrition. I think that's one of the really important things with KVs. We're gonna talk a little bit about grooming, um, particularly on those longer haired breeds. As you can imagine, they take a little extra care. And we're gonna finish up with a little talk about biosecurity because all those things sort of feed into making sure that our KVs stay healthy. So when we talk about KV housing, they're a little bit different than rabbits. So when we house our rabbits, most of us will house them on a wire bottom floor so that their droppings all fall through. Um, but you really can't do that with KVs. And the reason is that their little feet are a lot more spindly and they have these long spindly toes. Um, and those toes can really easily get hung up in that wire and they can actually break their toes and things. So it's not good for them to live on a wire floor like we would with our rabbits. Rabbits have those furry feet, they can handle it. Our kiwis really can't. We also really prefer to have a plastic or a metal bottom on that cage, not wood. 
Um, I have seen some really cute wood ones. The problem with wood is it's very difficult to keep clean and sanitized. So if it gets soaked with urine or the water bottle leaks and it gets wet, it's, it, wood is porous and it's hard to dry it out and clean it out and it's hard to disinfect it and keep it clean. Um, other than that, wire sides are ideal. Um, KVs really, they can't sweat just like dogs. They can't sweat to cool themselves, right? Um, so they really don't handle hot environments very well and they need a lot of ventilation. Um, so something with wire sides is really ideal. Um, we also want to maybe keep them in the house or someplace that's um, climate controlled or air conditioned, like a cooled shed or garage. Here in Arizona, it really probably gets too hot to have our KVs outdoors, um, at least in the summer months particularly, it's just too hot. Um, we also don't want to put their cage right under an AC vent. I know that seems like, oh, it will keep them cooler, but KVs are also very prone to illness if they're exposed to drafts and things. Um, so it's better if they're just in a climate controlled room and, and not right under the AC vent. Um, while they can live alone um, and they do just fine, they're also very happy in groups, um, but just make sure that unless you're planning to actually breed KVs to get baby KVs, which I don't, I don't even think I have time to talk about today, so make sure that your KVs are the same sex. So they're either all boys or all girls if you do intend to raise them in a group. Um, you'll also need to keep an eye out for fighting. Typically they get along fine, but you may find you have a couple that you need to separate if they aren't getting along. And finally, let's talk about that minimum size requirement. The generally recommended size is one and a half square feet per adult KV. That is a little on the small side though, that's pretty much the bare minimum. So you wanna make sure you have a little extra space. And if you have more KVs in that cage, you'll need to have more square footage for them to comfortably move around. Um, 18 by 18 inches is a pretty standard recommended size for one KV. Um, finally, we also wanna make sure that that cage is predator proof. And even if we're raising them inside, remember our other pets may become predators. Um, KVs are prey animals and dogs and cats are not. Um, so make sure that your KV cage is uh, inaccessible to your pet dog or pet cat or anything else you may have roaming around in your house. Um, that cage, the best thing to put on the bottom, we don't want them standing right on just the metal, right? Um, we want to use some type, some type of bedding. Wood shavings, um, like the ones pictured here, are probably the most common thing that I see. Definitely make sure that you don't use cedar. The oils in cedar um, can be toxic um, if they're in contact um, with them for a long time. And the smell can be a little overwhelming, especially for their little KV respiratory systems. So stick with pine or even better ash if you can get it. And typically these are pretty inexpensive. You can buy a really big bag for eight or 10 or 12 bucks and it will last a long time. There are some other commercial products available geared towards small animals like the So Fresh, which is like a shredded paper bedding. Um, these do work just fine. There's nothing wrong with them. They just tend to be a little bit more expensive uh, because they are kind of marketed for the pet owner for the small animal type thing in, in smaller containers that are a little more expensive. Um, but at the end of the day, use what works for you and your KVs. I've also heard of people successfully using things like horse stall bedding, the little pellets. Um, the little pellets work really well because you just give them like a little light mist and they'll kind of break up real quick and they do a really great job absorbing odor. Um, people also like to stuff things like hay, uh, grass hay, um, or Timothy hay, or orchard hay, or Bermuda grass type hay, um, which is dried hay, um, into the cage. The KVs will like to tear it apart, and they'll tunnel through it, and, and they'll actually consume it too, and the fiber is really good for them. Um, so that's some other things that people have used um, as well. But the, really the key is soft, absorbent, easily cleaned. Um, you're going to want to clean this frequently. Um, ammonia is really damaging to their respiratory symptom, uh, respiratory systems. I'm not sure why I taped symptoms, but I meant systems. Um, and sitting in soil bedding can cause urine scald and a lot of other things. We want to make sure we're really cleaning that regularly. And if you can smell ammonia, think about their little KV noses, you know, just a couple inches above the bedding and how much stronger it would be there. So make sure you're staying on top of that cleanliness. So let's talk really quickly about grooming our guinea pigs. So a couple of things we're going to need to have uh, sort of ready for this is number one is brushing and, and how frequently and what type of brushes you're going to use are really going to depend on what breed of KV you have. So those short hair breeds like the Americans probably aren't going to need brushed as frequently, really just when they're shedding to remove um, 
dead hair and help get that off of there better. But somebody like this guy, which I believe looks like it could be a silky uh, or a Peruvian, I'm not sure. It's gonna take a lot more care to keep them in show shape, right? So this was something that I did with my KV um, when I showed. Um, you use hair ties or rubber bands and paper towels work well. You clean and brush everything out, section the hair, and then you sort of just roll and make these little packages. And what that does is that keeps the hair up out of the bedding and so that it doesn't get dirty. But as you can imagine, this really needs to be, they need to be redone every few days um, so that they don't get tangled. Um, and you have to keep a very close eye on them for cleanliness with this. So I only recommend doing this if this is a KV that you intend to show and therefore you need their hair to be long and flowing and in perfect shape. Once you've decided that that KV's showing career is over, snip, snip, trim that bad boy up because this is a pain in the rear but you really need to do it um, for the health of the KV um, with that long hair because it is so long. Um, and then some of the other breeds, even like the Teddy um, and the Texel have their own unique styles of brushing and brushes that need to be done. Um, I didn't ever have those, but if you do have those breeds, I recommend you find somebody who's a really well-known breeder of them and get their advice um, on how uh, you should go about grooming those KVs um, properly to make sure that you don't destroy the integrity of their coat. The Abyssinians as well have their own brushing thing with those rosettes, um, making sure that you brush them so that they make their little ridges all the way around so that when they go on the show table, they really present at their best. Um, nail trimming is pretty standard practice. It needs to be done every few weeks. Um, don't cut the quick. So if you take a look at that toenail, and I wish I'd found a good picture, but I couldn't find one. Um, when you take a look at that toenail, you should actually be able to see, especially on the ones with lighter colored toenails, there's actually a blood vessel that runs through the middle of there and it stops partway out. And so you don't want to trim into that blood vessel. You want to stop trimming before you get to it because there's a nerve in there and it will hurt and it will bleed. Um, so just make sure you're trimming off the very end. Um, you don't want their nails to grow out of control and then end up with these big talons because they're not really meant to have that. So um, keep those nails trimmed down every few weeks um, and just keep an eye out that you don't cut that quick. If you've ever trimmed your dog's nails, it's very similarly. Um, bathing is really only something that should be done if necessary, if your kiwi gets very soiled, um, if they sit in their own poop or something, that's something you can do. Warm water, make sure you dry them thoroughly. Um, it's pretty easy to do in just the kitchen sink since they're so small. Um, and again, those long haired guinea pigs um, need those hair wraps done for sure um, for their own safety. So moving on to talk a little bit about water and um, the biggest thing with this is I highly encourage the use of these uh, water bottles with the little ball valve over a standard um, like a drinker cup. The problem with the open dishes with the, the cups, they're okay, but the water does get really dirty really fast. Guinea pigs, if you've ever had them, sometimes they get a little happy in their cages and they like to run around. They get like the little mini guinea pig zoomies and they kick up their bedding and everything and it ends up in the water. And then that's a really easy way to end up with coccidiosis problems, um, just dirty water that they don't want to drink because it's dirty now that, you know, it's got feces in it or something. Um, so those, these water bottles are really the ideal way to go. Um, it also makes it really easy to see how much they've been drinking. It keeps the water super clean. Um, the big thing is change them regularly. Make sure you're washing the bottle and get a little, um, little uh, like a straw brush to clean out the nipple um, and inspect them for leaks and clogging regularly. These do work off of a vacuum. Um, so the bottle itself needs to be fully sealed. Um, you'll put the cap on and then invert it. And a little bit of water may leak out at first, but then it should develop a vacuum in the top and that won't allow more water to come out until the guinea pig licks the little ball on the end and allows more air into the bottle. And that's what allows them to drink. But if that, if that bottle has any sort of a crack in it, um, they always seem to want to crack on the seams. Um, it will not hold water and all the water will just leak out. Um, so just keep a really close eye on those and replace them as necessary. They aren't terribly expensive. So this is really the nuts and bolts of what I want to get into today. Um, I see a lot of misinformation that goes around about KV nutrition, about what they should eat, how much they should eat. Um, 
whether they should be fed an all vegetable diet or a pellet diet. And I will tell you that your best choice is always gonna be a high quality guinea pig specific pelleted feed. Um, most guinea pigs can be fed free choice. However, do keep a close eye on their weight. Overweight guinea pigs are prone to more health problems. Um, and especially if you're planning to breed them, they can really struggle um, with the stocia or other issues um, if they're overweight. So if you have a guinea pig who is prone to being overweight, you may need to limit feed them their pellets. Start with about an eighth of a cup and then adjust up or down as needed until your guinea pig is the ideal weight. Um, they should also have uh, access to some sort of a free choice grass. Hey, Timothy is a popular choice, but anything uh, Bermuda or anything like that um, is fine as well. Um, just not alfalfa hay. We're looking for a grass hay here. It's a really great way for them to, it's an, it's an engaging enrichment thing for them to do to nibble hay. It's really good for their dental health um, as well as their mental stimulation. And then finally, they can have some small amounts of treats. So these are things like dark leafy greens, like spinach, kale, all those types of things. A few other vegetables in small amounts are okay as well, things like broccoli. But fruits, um, while they're okay, should only be fed in very small amounts. They're really high in sugar. And again, we're gonna end up with a, a guinea pig with an obesity problem if we feed them too many of these uh, treats on the side. So I would say dark leafy greens, maybe a small amount every day is okay. Um, those fruits maybe keep them to once or twice a week at the most. Um, now, this is where things get a little different about guinea pigs. So you can actually feed them high quality, 16% protein at least, rabbit pellets and everything will be fine. But what I wanna know in the chat, who knows what scurvy is? You see, yes, nailed it. Good job guys. Lack of vitamin C, a deficiency of vitamin C. So back in the 1700s, when uh, we were sailing ships everywhere for months on end, we didn't know what scurvy was, okay? No, nobody had a clue exactly what, um, what scurvy was or what it did. All they knew was that these sailors would be out on ships for weeks and months without access to fresh food, but they didn't know that this was the reason at the time. And they would start to develop this strange illness. Their teeth would start to fall out. They'd get spots on their skin, their joints would ache, um, their gums would bleed. Um, and it was just really not a good thing and we couldn't figure this out. And finally, a doctor figured out that if they gave the sailors lemons for the whole trip, they never developed this disease. And so they finally determined that this was actually caused by the lack of vitamin C, which is called ascorbic acid and is present in a lot of fresh fruits and vegetables. And most animals can create their own vitamin C. They have an enzyme that they use and they can make their own. Humans and guinea pigs cannot make their own vitamin C. We need to consume this vitamin daily. This slide's not advancing. There we go. So because we need to consume this every day, so they solved this in the sailors by sending, making sure that, that they had enough lemon and lime juice and stuff for the sailors to consume their, their, through their entire trip and everything was fine. Um, so guinea pig pellets are fortified with vitamin C. That means that they have enough vitamin C in them that if, as long as the guinea pigs are consuming a proper amount of those pellets and they're being consumed within about 90 days of the date of manufacture of the bag because vitamin C is not super stable, it will break down, although they have some new stabilized forms now that are a little bit better. So as long as your guinea pig is eating those fortified guinea pig pellets, they will be getting enough vitamin C and they will be fine. If you choose to feed a rabbit pellet, maybe you have rabbits too and you can't, don't have access to a guinea pig specific food, you need to supply supplemental vitamin C to your guinea pigs. There are some in those dark leafy greens, the citrus fruits, the broccoli, some of the other fruits and vegetables. I would encourage you to still purchase some sort of supplemental vitamin C product to feed to your guinea pigs. Um, there's several products on the market. There's tablets, there's little treats that you just give them a treat every day and they eat it and all is gravy. Um, there are some that go in the water. Be a little cautious about those um, just because it does break down. You'll need to make sure that you're one, putting enough in there that they're getting enough of it. Two, that they like it and it's not causing them to drink less water um, because they don't like the taste of it. 
Um, and three, that you're changing the water frequently enough that it doesn't um, break down and become basically um, inactive. One of the things that will break it down is, is sunlight or light. Um, and if it's in one of those white bottles, obviously light is able to get into it. So I would encourage you to go the route of the, the, the tablets or the, um, the treats are a good way to do it. And then maybe some additional fruits and veggies and you should be fine. But this is really one of the biggest um, probably problems that I see with, with guinea pigs is a lack of vitamin C. Um, just because people don't always realize or understand that they do need this additional um, vitamin. They cannot make it like almost every other species um, can. So is my guinea pig sick? What do you guys think? Uh, you can throw this in the chat for me. What are some of the things that would tell you that your guinea pig is sick? Sneezing? Weight loss. I'm not sure what off D means, Josephine. Like off feed, is that what you wanted to type? Lack of appetite. Good. Runny eyes and nose. Yes. Good. Okay. Not eating. Yep. You guys are nailing it here. Yeah. So we have a lot. Dull coat. Dull coat. That's a really good one. So we have a lot of things that could tell us that our guinea pig is sick, right? Um, if we see that our guinea pig is not eating or drinking, that's a really good indication that our guinea pig might not be feeling well. If they're acting depressed, they're not as active as they normally are, they're not interested in treats that they're normally interested in, um, that might be an indication. Sneezing, coughing, crusty eyes, all an indication of a respiratory problem going on here. Hair loss and scratching is another reason, thing we could look for. Diarrhea or bloody urine is something that could happen. If we see them tilting or shaking their head, sometimes that's an indication of ear mites or an ear infection of some kind, or just generally not acting like themselves. Um, and so I don't, um, I'm not a veterinarian and I, I do encourage you to, to work with a veterinarian if you need to, because some of these things that could be wrong with your guinea pig may need an antibiotic um, or something that, um, something that you can't get over the counter. But it's good for you to know some of the things that could be going on so that you're on the lookout for them. So we already talked about scurvy and that vitamin C deficiency problem. The other thing that we could have is things like external parasites. These would be things like lice and mites. The, the lice that KVs get are not the same ones that people get. They are different. Um, so you can't get them from your KV and your KV can't get them from you. However, ringworm, which is a, a fungal infection, is something that can be passed to people. So if you see something like that, you'll want to be cautious. Bumblefoot is something we see usually due to wire floors or very dirty floors um, where they get like an infection, they get a, a rub spot, it gets infected and it gets swollen and they get this little pustule kind of thing in there. Um, we see colds or respiratory um, infections, virus or bacteria caused. Um, and fun fact, some of your respiratory infections can actually be passed to your KV if you are sick. Um, so it is recommended that if you are sick, that you get somebody else in your family to take care of your KV um, during that time. So if, you, if you're sick with a regular rhinovirus cold, that they can't get, but they are susceptible to influenza A and B. So if that's what you have, that could be, you could give that to them. Uh, uroliths are a type of bladder stone that KVs are very prone to. And then finally, pneumonia, an infection in the lungs. Usually it's bacterial. Um, these are not an exhaustive entire list of the things that KVs could get sick with, um, but it is just a little, um, just a little starter list, um, just so you can be aware of some of, the, some of the things that could be happening with our KVs. Most of these can be prevented with cleanliness, with proper management, with good nutrition, like we talked about, that vitamin C especially, and finally, with biosecurity, okay? So biosecurity, I know this is a big scary word, but we have talked about this before. If you, any of you were on the rabbit one, the very first one that we did, um, we talked about biosecurity, okay? And so biosecurity is anything, any of the myriad of things that we do or could do to keep our animals from getting sick. Okay, so this starts with good nutrition and good management, making sure that we have proper cages, that we have proper waterers, 
that we have, um, you know, the KVs in the right place, um, you know, so that it's not too hot for them, anything like that. Um, it's making sure that we're not taking them around sick animals. So if we take our KVs to the show and we see some animals um, that somebody else has brought that look like they might be sick, that we keep them away. And also that if we have a sick KV, that we don't take any KVs to a show and expose somebody else's animals, right? Because we wouldn't want somebody else to expose our animals and we don't want to do that to them either. Um, it's minimizing contact with other animals at shows. And I know at KV shows, it's really difficult to do with the way that they bring them up to the table and line them up and the judge goes through everything. I know it's not possible to, to, to completely eliminate contact, but certainly minimize it, right? Um, don't be taking your KV around to visit everybody else's KV in the show. Only take them to the table and take them straight back to your little setup um, so that they aren't necessarily touching every other KV. Um, it's quarantining any animals that you purchase that are new to your herd um, or any animals that you have that are traveling to shows. If you have some that are traveling and some that are not traveling, um, you might consider having a separate space for those animals that are traveling to shows frequently um, where they aren't in contact with the rest of your animals so that they aren't necessarily bringing something back from the show and giving it to all of your KBs. You can at least help to keep the spread of that disease minimized um, and quarantine means having them housed separately ha where they can't touch each other or have any sort of contact or have respiratory droplets travel between two cavies. So preferably a different room means that we're not sharing equipment between those two groups of animals, right? We're not taking brushes or feed tubs or water bottles back and forth between the two sets of cavies. They have their own set. And when we go to take care of those animals, we want to go take care of our non-quarantined animals first. And then we can go take care of our quarantined animals. And before we go back to our non-quarantined animals, we need to make sure that we change clothes, that we wash up so that we aren't the ones taking a potential disease back and forth. And so normally we would say 30 days for new animals being brought in, we'd want to quarantine them. That's to give time for any potential disease that they may be carrying and you not know about it yet. That's to give that disease time if it's going to manifest that you hopefully will catch it before it's been transmitted to your other animals. Um, so 30 days is the sort of typical time, time frame for that. And then finally, it's also not sharing equipment with somebody else. If you have friends that have KVs, um, it's not sharing equipment back and forth. Um, not handling their animals and then coming right home and handling yours without changing clothes and washing up. Um, and the same thing, make sure that you wear clean clothes to go over there, not ones you've handled your own KBs in. All that can really just help um, prevent diseases from going back and forth. Although I think all things told, KBs are fairly robust um, and I feel like they probably have fewer issues than some other animal species with contaminating diseases back and forth. Um, certainly, I don't think they have as much to worry about right now as, say, rabbits, where we have that rabbit hemorrhagic disease um, going around right now. Um, if you don't know about that and you have rabbits, we do. We did do a, a webinar on that back in November. Was it November, Betsy? Yeah, November, the first one. Yeah, the very first one. And that recording is up. If you guys haven't seen it and you want to go watch it and you have rabbits, um, it is, it is going to be a serious problem for us here for some time. Um, but those are some things for biosecurity to think about um, as, we're, as we're going through this. And I actually believe that um, that's my last slide that went faster than I thought it was going to. <laughs> I don't know how or why, but I see we have some questions in the Q&A. Do you want me to yeah. take those or do we want to let Heather we're, have the stage? Yeah, we've, we've got a little bit of time. Let's catch a couple of them and then we'll go to Heather who's joined us. Um, can you back up to your grooming slide? Yes, I sure can. And then you can pop in and show, give a little bit more, <clears throat> a little closer look at this one. So what exactly is a hair wrap and why would I use that? So yeah, so that hair wrap, so Josephine, do you see how the hair of that guinea pig, um, do you see how long it is and how it's hanging down onto, um, onto the floor sort of of the, of the, of the mat there. Um, and if you can imagine that guinea pig walking around in its own cage, um, it's gonna be picking up anything that's in the bedding, right? So urine, feces, 
because they sort of just poop in their bedding wherever and we just, we clean it frequently, but we can't obviously aren't gonna clean it every hour. Um, and so what'll happen is that that hair coat will get really dirty. It'll get really matted from them kind of walking on it. Um, and, and then once it gets matted, it's really hard to untangle. And it's kind of unfair to the guinea pig to have to make them tolerate having all those mats undone when we could prevent them. So this hair wrap, what it basically is, is as a lot of people use like paper towels, there's some other things people use. They, they'll sometimes cut their own squares of fabric, that kind of thing. Um, and you take and you make these sections in the hair and then you fold and wrap over and roll them up and make this little neat little package so that all the hair is sort of rolled up off the ground and it's protected. Yeah, and it's kind of like braiding up your own hair. Like, like I have long hair and I like to braid mine at night so that I don't wake up with a rat's nest in the morning. It's kind of the same concept um, so that the guinea pig doesn't get mad at all the time. And then we just redo these every few days um, so that their hair stays really clean and nice. So that when we go to a show, they have this beautiful coat all spread out, kind of like, let me go back. So when they show them, they spread this hair out on the table and make it look all nice and pretty, right? And so this way, when we go to the show, we can take the hair wraps out. And when we show these animals, we can really um, spread that hair coat out and, and really show it off to, to its best ability. Um, and it'll stay clean and it'll stay nice. Um, and it's also just a little, it's better for the guinea pig's health too, to not have all those mats and stuff. So so kind of staying with that, just because we've got that next question, then we'll get back to Karen's and Kaylee's, um, you know, talking about what if you wash them in a little dish, can you just talk a little bit about, you showed guinea pigs a lot, right? Or cavies. Um, I, I, I didn't show gu guinea pigs as much as I showed rabbits. I showed okay. rabbits way more, but I did have a couple. It does look like a dress. Yes. Isn't it adorable? Aren't they adorable? They, I think they look like Tribbles. Mine was named Tribble, if anybody's a Star Trek fan. Um, <laughs> I, I think my brother had the best name for his guinea pig. It was named Cordless. Cordless. And, and he was very active. And he'd go, eek, eek. <laughs> <laughs> so bathing. I assume that you can't blow dry them without traumatizing them. Actually, you'd be surprised you can. <laughs> okay. Um, but so you can bathe them. You can do it in the sink. You can do it in a little dish. Um, you, you don't want to do this too frequently. You don't want to strip the oils out of the coat. Um, and Maybe Heather can answer this a little bit too. I, I think there might be something going on with the teddies where you don't really don't wanna bathe them, but I, I did not raise teddies, so do not, do not quote me on that. Um, anything that you can contain them with um, in, a, in a little bit is, is great. Um, you know, a small, a small dish, uh, the kitchen sink with a little bit of water, you wanna use nice warm water. Um, a nice gentle, usually a kitten shampoo is recommended, something very gentle. Um, don't use a per people shampoo, don't use soap, use something really gentle for like cats is usually pretty acceptable. Since they're sensitive to so many things, their stuff tends to be designed for that. So, And, um, and Heather, if you want to unmute and bring your picture up, if you have some something to share yeah. on bathing yeah. pig, guinea pigs, please do. Totally. And, and you want to dry them fast, you don't want them to get chilled. Um, I think I saw in the chat, somebody said they use, yep, you use a blow dryer. Just be real, real gentle with it. Don't put it on like furnace blast um, and keep your hand. I always kind of kept my hand there so that if it, I got a hot spot, it would get my hand first. And I knew I needed to move the hair dryer so that I wasn't making them too hot. If that makes sense, like my hand was the litmus test. Um, and then you could kind of get them, get them really dry. Cause that's one thing you don't want to do is have them get chilled. So yeah. Um, that's sort of the key with the bathing. There's Heather. Okay, Heather, you got some more bathing tips while we're on that topic? Oops, sorry. And of go. course I can't see any of you anymore because I screwed up my screen, so I'm sorry. That's okay, that's <laughs> but, <all right>. um, <clears throat> So the biggest part there is it does absolutely depend on the breed that you're raising. Um, teddies, you do not want to bathe pretty much ever. Um, it will ruin their coats. Um, it uh, destroys kind of their density. But what you would do instead to um, prepare them for the show is you actually take a, a hair dryer and you put it on low, um, on low heat and uh, you do just blow out all the, um, they get almost a dandruffy um, kind of dead skin because their, their coat is so thick if you get a good teddy. 
um, and it just blows out all of that and all of the loose hairs and it really, really makes their coat look very nice. Um, so that's what we do. My daughter raises teddies. Um, so that's what we do to prepare instead of washing them is right before the teddies are called up to be brought up to be judged. Then we just take them all out and we hit them with a blow dryer. Um, and then uh, teddy coats are important that you do them from the back end to the front, which is completely opposite of um, most of the other guinea pigs or all of the other guinea pigs. Um, so teddies, you want to go back to front. That's how you uh, keep their coat nice and thick and plush like you want a teddies to be. Um, the other kind of unique thing for teddies is because they lay on one side or the other, then you find flat spots. Um, so you want to, as their babies, really pay attention to those portions and work the coat is what we call it. So you find what side the guinea pig prefers to lay on and you really try to uh, work that coat side so that it doesn't become flat because that is a common comment on um, teddies when they're judged is that one side is flatter than the other or they can see flat spots from um, where their feet are up towards the top. The judges really like to see that uniform um, uh, kink go all the way down to the to the bottom of the of the cavy of the teddy. So um, I'm gonna... Americans you wash but oh, you want to do that. Like, yep. Sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead and finish your washing. Was there a question oh, about Teddy? Uh, so there is a question Karen Donaldson asked. Did oh. Teddy have the Rex gene? And maybe... Um, you know, the Rex is actually um, more of a European term. Um, so there is some genetic piece to that. Um, we here just have the Teddies, but there is some... Um, piece to that genetics, but really the Rex term is only used in the European side of showing cavies. We don't use that term here in the US. Okay, so let me ask you, um, okay, so I think Kaylee asked, can you brush the dandruff out? And so you were talking about blowing the dandruff out, but I think Ashley was earlier talking about also brushing the dandruff out as well. So what we found most of the time with teddies, if you actually brush it out, it depends on the brush that you're using. But a lot of times what happens is you actually pull the hairs and then you actually um, pull more of them out and it creates an unevenness in their coat. So you'll do a lot better if you use a hairdryer. Okay. Yeah. I, I was mentioning with the, with so the Americans, if they are shedding all their dry, all their dead at the shedding time, that's when you would want to just gently brush to try to get that dead hair out on the Americans, not on the teddies. I never had teddies. So I, this yeah. is fascinating then, because I knew they had some weird with that little corkscrew curly plush coat thing. There was some different rules for them than for everybody else. Okay, so, so before we go any further, we could still keep asking questions. We got another couple, but I want to make sure that we get time to let Heather and Josh Moore, who's also with us, talk about the 4-H opportunities in caveys. So I don't know who's sharing. Josh, are you sharing slides? Ashley, you can pull yours. I'm trying to figure out how to stop yes. sharing. I was like, that's definitely Josh. I don't have slides. <laughs> that's, you, may need to, you may need to revoke my sharing if I'm sharing. Okay. Stop participant sharing. Okay. Now you should, rest of you should be able, Josh, are you doing, oh, here we go. It, it apparently, now you should be able to share. Perfect. I'm pulling it up right now. Excellent. Okay. So I, I, I'm sorry I had to get on a little bit later, but um, I, I think, have you already introduced Heather? I can do that really quickly. Uh, go for it. I just said her name, but you go ahead and share. Awesome. All right. So Heather, uh, my name is Josh Moore. I'm, uh, I'm the, for the time being, the 4-H agent here in Pima County that handles livestock programs. Um, but Heather is my go-to person for all things KV. She's, uh, she, in our county, we have a hierarchy of um, volunteers and Heather is our project coordinator for the KV project. And so she runs our entire county program um, and has been doing it for about two years, right, Heather? I believe so. Two or three. I think it's uh, two. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And anyways, so, um, and she's also <laughs> a 
project leader for the Northwest Outriders 4-H Club. Um, she's raised uh, two great KB uh, showmen and great kids in general. Actually, in the picture, the young lady on the right, that's Heather's uh, daughter, Emily. Um, so, yeah, anyways, though, uh, I put together this PowerPoint for Heather um, to kind of talk about our program. And, of course, I know that there's usually a lot of questions, so I, I didn't go too in-depth. And, Heather, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I just kind of wanted to give a brief overview, but I know there's usually in these programs more questions than anything else about general care for KBs, and Heather's the person to answer that. So um, with that being said, I'll kind of move on to our first slide. Um, our county is broken up just like normal counties into large and small stock different programs. Within our small stock program, uh, KB is one of them. We offer a breed show, showmanship. Um, there's a poster competition, club displays, and then there's advanced KB. Um, I don't know if you want to go in depth on any of these, Heather. Oops. Um, you know, I think the only thing that I would add here for breed shows is I really feel like we have a great relationship with one of the leading um, state uh, shows here in town. So um, like I'm also the vice president of Grand Canyon State KB Club. Um, and so those are all the adult breeders here in Arizona. Um, and so I feel like that creates a really good relationship for the youth to get quality animals. Um, so these adults look forward to meeting the youth and um, encouraging the youth, make sure that they have great animals to start the project with. Um, and so they oftentimes are at our youth events um, and really set these kids up for a great success um here in pima county and beyond I, they really helped a lot of kids even up in maricopa um pinal county um so i know a lot of really great adult breeders as well that can help kids get started in the project awesome so um some of the what i've noticed especially here in our county um we tend to in a normal year anyways we tend to have a pretty robust program in terms of offering for kids to participate not only in say uh, shh um, not only on the 4-h side but also um like heather had mentioned on the local uh, show side as well um so in addition to our county fair and the shows that we have there's also arba shows um, throughout the state, there's the Colorado River Small Stock Show, which rotates between um, Mojave County, uh, sometimes it's in Yavapai County, or it's uh, in La Paz County, so it rotates between those three. Um, in Pima County, we run the 4-H Fur and Feather Show that usually happens in November. Not only is it, it's a, kind of like a jackpot show, it's mainly to teach our youth about showmanship, but our KB program usually goes above and beyond, and they, they tend to have an open breed show as well. So that's always really kind of cool. Um, and then they put on a second show, which is the Rabbit KB Classic Show every year in March. And then I know that there's also the Grand Canyon, um, the club that Heather had mentioned. Um, one cool thing I think that in this picture, um, this is from a few years ago, the girl standing behind, who's the judge for the show, um, she was an alumni of our program. I feel like um, we're really lucky to have um, some kids that really enjoyed raising KB, um, and it seems like they like to come back and continue to give back, and so we utilize them a lot for showmanship judges, um, and that's a kind of a great culture that we've learned that we had here, where our alumni come back and they serve in some format. Anything that I should embellish on, Heather? I just, I think that's absolutely true. I think, um, I know that Emily, my daughter, writes a lot for the judges, so she's just really had a great support from them. Um, a couple of them have actually written letters for her, for her college um, uh, adventures that are coming up. And I just, the support system and the camaraderie there in the KV Project is, is really, um, um encouraging for me it's uh, it's it's a great um project to start for a lot of kids for 4-h um one thing that i had mentioned like the learning opportunities for for and i think heather hit the nail on the head there it, not only is it a great starter project but i in in this county i've really witnessed kids take it from being a starter project to really 
sticking with it and growing with the program throughout the year. Whereas maybe it starts with one animal. Um, it's something that no matter what the living situation is in terms of like with some projects, you know, the only way you can do them is if you have access to large amounts of land. Um, but, you know, there's kids here who live in apartment complexes um, that have the space to be able to raise cabies. So it's friendly to different living situations. And the really cool thing is I've seen it turn into a lifelong experience where some of our adult volunteers, you know, something they may have done as a young child, but they remain passionate throughout their life and are involved on a national level as well. So it's something that can start as a starter or maybe an introduction to 4-H, but you can also expect kids to take it to the next level and maybe become breeders and become competitive. Um, and the I feel like the KV world has a lot of great leadership opportunities outside of 4-H. Um, like for example, I know that they have like a pageant program. Um, I feel like our KV members also are usually very good at presenting. Um, they put together uh, you know some of our every year we require our kids to do educational displays and the kv displays are always top notch because the importance and the emphasis of knowledge is just so important and um, i know that one thing that i've learned from heather and my other leaders is that having the standard of perfection um, is probably a number one tool that a kv person needs um, and it's, it's something that they can get and it looks like they're good for several years so i I, I stole some pictures off of the project's Facebook page, and I thought this one kind of emphasized the importance of it because every kid should have one, every leader should have one. Um, it takes the guesswork out of, of being a leader, but also being a member. Do you want to add anything, Heather? Oh. There's, there's so much information in that book, both for Rabbit and for KB. Um, so it's a great resource. It's where most of our judges pull um, most of the questions that they ask them for knowledge. Um, and just kind of to echo what you said there too, I think um, what I really appreciate about KB and Rabbit, and kind of a side note, my kids do both small stock and large stock, um, is that there's really an emphasis on not just kind of knowing how to go through the motions of the showmanship for the cavies and the rabbits. But I also feel like um, there's a true emphasis on really knowing the care, the husbandry, the um, taking care of little ailments that your, your animal might have, how to know how to recognize those and treat those. I think that's why the posters turn out so good for our kids for fair and stuff is that we really do um, stress to the kids that it's important to pay attention to those things and know what it means and how to fix them. Um, and so I, I think that it just teaches them so much more than just how to walk an animal down an aisle or put it on a table and, you know, flip it around a couple of times. I, it's, it really teaches them what they need to know and prep them for, you know, a future career um, that involves animals if that's something that they want to do. Definitely. And I know that in the past, Heather and our other leaders have put together um, educational days. We're lucky enough to have a volunteer who is also a, a small animal veterinarian. Um, and I remember it was my, my maybe my second year on the job. And uh, I got to sit through that workshop and I learned so much not only about um, like anatomy, but also about ailments and things like that, where I, I walked out feeling extremely enlightened. Um, and as a 4-H member, I, I mostly participated in livestock and I had no idea the amount of, of knowledge that goes into the KV project until I went to that workshop. But um, one thing that I know that I've started cultivating here, um, I had a chance to meet with the veterinary, um, some veter a couple of clubs that the veterinary college has um, about their members or their students are wanting to find opportunities to volunteer with 4-H, not only in Pima County, but as they go throughout the state, finding ways to cultivate relationships as, as they go on their path to become veterinarians. And um, it's amazing the amount of 4-H members who consider that as a possible career option. So I'm hoping in the future 4-H will kind of continue to cultivate a relationship with our vet school um, to maybe get access to those vet students um, with your with your members as well. Because I think not only do they share a good story about this is a future possibility for you, but they also have a lot of knowledge. And I feel like most, most vets tend to end up going in the small animal route. And yeah, I think it could be a good option to maybe um, talk to them about KVs and things like that. So I know that last night in my meeting, we talked, we ended up talking about the KV project and the KV show for quite a while. And I had quite a few vet students who are interested. And it turns out like they got their start with animals, you know, with KVs. Um, so I don't know, kind of cool opportunity. But 
Um, some of the things, uh, one, an opportunity for us, if, if you've never seen a KB show or you're interested, um, our spring showdown is coming up um, and we're going to live stream our shows. And um, so what we'll do is we'll have a, 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 a camera in the ring so that way you can watch along. And if you, I mean, if you're interested or maybe you want to learn more about how KB showmanship is done, I invite you to participate. Um, our show is on the 18th, which is a Sunday, and we're going to do a breed show at 9 a.m. followed by showmanship. And if you're interested, you can watch on either our YouTube or our Facebook page. Um, and we'll live stream it from there. Um, so with that being said, that's kind of the end of our PowerPoint, but I know there's probably questions or anything like that. And um, any, anything Heather or I could answer, we'd love to help. Well, one question that we do have in there, how much do KVs cost? And I know that could vary, but give us some general ideas. <clears throat> you know, I'm actually really glad that came out. Um, so I would say that most reputable breeders that I know in this general area are going to charge anywhere between $20 and $40 for a guinea pig, which is about what you're going to pay at PetSmart or Petco, any of those places. Um, so uh, it's really important if you do want to um, show a guinea pig for um, or with 4-H, please, please, please ask leaders um, I am happy to share my information with people so that they can uh, get in contact with a record of a breeder so I can set you up with an animal that would be good for a show table for the show table. Um, there are many people out there who breed cavies that may not necessarily fit the standard. And if you're going to pay the same amount from them that you will from a good breeder, you might as well start off with something that's going to fit the bill in both counts. Um, so definitely, you know, feel free to contact me. I'm happy to, you know, I don't know the best place to share my information, yeah, you can, you but can I know that, a lot of readers here. You can put that in the chat. In if the you chat. Want to. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Okay. I'll put it here. Oh, actually, I think I'm going to just. So I do I have, have, I know pretty much. Every... <laughs> okay. So I do have um, a question that we had come up. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing and then I'll share for a minute. And we can also have other questions. Um, oops, see if we can share. The one question was, and I gotta get, see all this stuff I have to keep track of here. I'll move it onto my other screen now. Um, questions on what we have coming up. And so at the AZ 4-H Ag at home, Animal Projects page, you can see that tonight. And then we have carcass judging, and then dairy, and that could be goat and or cow, we'll let you know. And horse judging, then we'll have another beef cattle. And we're actually going to have a working dog special edition. And then we'll see where it goes from that. So you see that we're moving it because we're starting to go in person, that we are moving to once a month. Okay, the first, after this next one on the 22nd of April, we'll be doing the first Thursday of each month. And if we keep having people come in, then we can, you know, we'll discuss and see if we continue these on. So that's just, and then again, if you wanna see where those other webinars are, those are available from this page as well, where you signed up. So who else has other questions? Okay, my questions went away, so I have to find them. Looks like one got answered. Do we have other questions? Wow, we're ending prior to seven o'clock then. Um, this is the first time ever. First time ever. So we certainly would like to thank our speaker, Ashley Wright, who did a really cool job and had some great pictures. And then also, Heather and Josh for sharing the 4-H and some other additional information. And, and just also, I did have a guinea pig named Walter too, because he talked like Walter Cronkite. Cronkite. <laughs> <laughs> and he taught my mom how to get lettuce out of the refrigerator. Because every time he'd, he was in my bedroom and every time she'd go and open the fridge, he'd start squeak squeaking and she'd bring some lettuce and say, here, go Walter <laughs> so but I didn't show them I just played pet had them as pets 
So anything else that anyone else, Heather, you want to share any last thoughts for our, our people? So how long does a show normally last? It looks like you're typing an answer, but you can go ahead and share that verbally. That's if what you I want. was going to type. Um, you know, it totally, totally depends on the number of entries. It absolutely depends on that. Um, and most of the time, if it's combined youth and adult um, entries, the adult entries are a little bit more than the youth, so it'll last a little bit longer. But maybe half a day ish. Okay. Anything else that any of you want to share or any last questions that we have? Wow. 6.59. Okay. Well, we certainly would love to thank you all for joining us and also to our presenters. Thank you so much. And on April 22nd, we have, what's our next one? Carcass, Carcass judging. judging. Carcass judging. So join us on April 22nd and we thank you for being with us and